Hello viewers, welcome to another episode. In the last two episodes, we have been discussing the general anatomy of bone and the ossification process in detail. In this episode, we have tried to summarize this entire information to give you an idea about how the bone grows in length as well as in width. So let's begin. Now let us discuss how a cancellous bone develops into a compact bone. The first form osteons do not have a clear laminar structure but it consists of a woven bone or a cancellous bone. Now let's see how it happens. Now, as you can see in this picture, uh, this is a trabecular or a cancellous bone. In between there are spaces which are known as the marrow cavity. Now the osteoblasts, they will come down and they will lay the lamina of the bone as we have seen in the uh, in our earlier episodes. Now once they lay down the first lamina, subsequently the second lamina will come and like this a concentric lamellae are laid down inside this ring and thus they will form an osteon. Now the original space of the bone marrow which was there it becomes smaller and smaller and whatever remains over there uh, is now called as the haversian canal. Now the first form haversian system like this are known as the primary osteon or atypical haversian system. Now these osteons do not have a typical lamellar structure and their chemical composition may also be a little different. What happens next is that these primary osteon or these atypical haversian system will be soon invaded by some blood vessels and along with the blood vessels there will come some osteoclasts. Now these osteoclasts they will bore a new series of spaces through these primary osteons. Uh, the new spaces are again filled with the bony lamellae in a very similar manner under the influence of these osteoblasts which come again over here. Now once these um, concentric lamellae are formed by the osteoblasts, the full grown haversian system or the osteons here are known as the secondary osteons or a typical haversian system. Now this process of formation and the destruction of the osteons, they are taking place repeatedly as the bone is enlarging in size and will continue even after birth. Now in this way the internal structure of a bone can be repeatedly remodeled to suit the stresses imposed on the bone. One important thing over here to note down is here you can see the remnants of the previous generation of osteons that is the primary osteons and these lie in the triangular intervals of the secondary osteons which are formed just now. Now these plates of bones are called the interstitial lamellae, something which we have already discussed in our previous episodes. The second important thing over here to note is that the first form layer of the secondary osteon is atypical in a sense that it is having a very high density of mineral deposit. Now this layer can subsequently be identified as the cement line. Now this cement line separates the osteon from the previously formed elements that is the primary osteon. This cement line is also called the reversal line because uh, at this point the process of bone erosion stops and uh, at the same point the process of bone formation begins. So the cement lines are never present around the primary osteon. This is something which you should remember but they are always present around subsequent generation of the secondary osteons. Now a hard tissue like bone can grow by apposition. Appositional growth is the deposition of new bone over the surface of existing bone. For example, let us now see the growth of one of the cranial bones that forms the vault of the skull. Let's consider the parietal bone. The ossification of the parietal bone begins in one or more small areas. We know that these are called the centers of ossification. Uh, at first, the narrow trabeculis or spicules of bones are formed. Now the spicules increase in length because of the deposition of bone at their ends. Now when the spicules lengthen, they start radiating from the center of ossification to the periphery. Gradually, the whole mesenchymal condensation is invaded by ossification. Now the bone assumes its normal shape. 
Now, as you can observe in this illustration, uh, two layers of bones are formed. One is the overlining outer periosteum, which is formed by the mesenchymal cells, and an inner lining of bones is also formed. Two bones are separated by fibrous tissue, which later form the sutures. Now, how does the bone grow in thickness and size? The overlying periosteum forms bone by intramembranous ossification. Also, there is deposition of bone on the edges adjoining the sutures because of which the bone starts growing in size. At the same time, bone is being removed from the inner surface. In this way, the bone grows in size, increasing the size of the cranial cavity, but the thickness of the bone does not increase too much. Now let us have a look at how a long bone grows. We need to remember that a long bone grows in both lengthwise and thickness wise. That is, it increases both in length as well as in thickness. First of all, a cartilaginous model for the long bone is laid down. Then the ossification starts at the center through a primary center of ossification. Simultaneously, the periosteum lays down a layer of bone around the shaft of the same cartilaginous model. This is called the bone collar. We need to remember that the bone developing from the primary ossification center is being ossified by enchondral ossification while the bone that is being laid down around the model which is the periosteal collar is being laid down by membranous ossification. This periosteal collar extends to the whole length of the diaphysis. Now as the enchondral ossification extends towards the end, more and more layers of periosteal bone is being laid down, which makes the bone grow thicker and thicker. Now to prevent the periosteal bone from becoming too thick, the osteoclasts come into play. What do they do? These osteoclasts start removing the bone from the inner aspect. So we can see that the bone is being laid down from the outside. At the same time, it is being removed from the inside. This prevents the bone from becoming too thick. The osteoclasts also start removing the trabeculi, which is lying in the center of the bone that is being formed by enchondral ossification. This is the way how the marrow cavity is formed. Gradually, most of the bone which is being formed from the primary center that is of enchondral origin is being removed. The shaft increases in diameter, increasing the size of the marrow cavity. The marrow cavity also extends towards the ends of the diaphysis, but it does not reach the epiphyseal plate. In this way, the shaft of the long bone is formed with a marrow cavity at the center. Now this shaft consists entirely of cortical bone, which is formed by membranous ossification from the surrounding, replacing the enchondral bone which was being ossified in the center. So now you know what happens in the shaft of the long bone. What happens in the end? The ends of the long bones, which now you know are called epiphyses, they start ossifying from secondary centers of ossification. These secondary centers appear after birth. And the bones that are being formed will be formed by enchondral ossification. The epiphyseal plate of cartilage, it will lie between the epiphysis and the end of the diaphysis, which is called the metaphysis. Now, last but not the least, a few points which we should remember is that the shaft or the diaphysis is formed by the primary center of ossification. Here, initially there was the enchondral bone, but gradually as it develops, the enchondral part is replaced by the intramembranous bone. And the center of it, it, there lies the marrow cavity. The epiphysis is the part of the bone towards the ends which develops from the secondary center. It consists of the cancellous bone and which develops from the enchondral ossification. And it has got no marrow cavity. The metaphysis part, which is also known as the epiphysal end of the diaphysis, is a very vascular area. And here it is an area where there is a lot of active bone growth. The cancellous bone is present 
in the metaphysis and this cancellous bone develops from again the anchondral ossification and there is no marrow cavity over here. The epiphyseal plate is a plate of cartilage which lies between metaphysis and the epiphysis and it transforms to the epiphyseal line after complete ossification of the bone. Here we come to the end of this short episode for this week. So hereby we complete the bone anatomy which includes the histology, the general anatomy of bone in a very comprehensive manner and uh, a few things which are left over here that is the applied importances will be uh, done in the next episode. Thank you.